afternoon, everyone. Uh, good evening for those joining uh, from Yemen or other places. And a warm welcome, everyone, to today's event on Yemen and its environment and environmental dimensions to conflict and peace building in Yemen. Um, I'm Katarina Yautz. I'm a project manager at the Berkhoff Foundation. And I will be guiding you through this event together with my dear colleague and teammate, Callum. Um, he's a junior project manager of the Yemen unit. And um, today's event is part of Berkhoff's 50th anniversary series. Um, and it also marks a very important milestone for us as members of the Yemen unit, because 2022 is actually the 10th year of our engagement in and on Yemen, together with our dear um, project partner and partner organization in Yemen, um, the Political Development Forum. Um, I'm very excited to see so many of you joining us today, um, particularly because I think most of us have probably another conflict uh, in our minds at the moment um, that seems to be very daunting and um, yeah, taking up a lot of mind space, at least in, in my case. But I also think it's very important to not forget about conflicts that have been ongoing and are quite devastating in its impact for a long time and challenges that will stay with us and with the entire globe for a long time, like climate change. So again, I'm very happy to see you all joining today. Um, let me give you a short overview of our program today. Um, after opening remarks by our executive director, Andrew Gilmore, and an introduction to the topic by Callum, um, we will be discussing questions of Yemen's environment, climate change, and how that affects conflict, and for that matter, peace building in Yemen at the local and the national level. And we'll do so uh, with an excellent panel of Yemen connoisseurs and environmental experts whom we will introduce to you in a minute. Um, in the second half of the event then, we are looking forward to discussing with all of you, the audience, and hear your questions. So I'm already inviting you to use the Q&A function of this Zoom call to share your questions with us, and please do so throughout the event. We will be, will be collecting your questions in the background and then address them in the second half of the event. Finally, just a technical note um, that this event today will be held in English and Arabic. Um, so if you want to follow your event, the event in your preferred language, you need to choose um, your language setting. And it depends which device you're connecting from. Uh, so if you're connecting from a desktop, please use this globe sign on the right bottom handle of your screen to choose your channel. Um, if you're connecting from a mobile device, um, there are three dots that you need to click, uh, choose more, choose your language, and then confirm to be able to hear the event in your native language. Now, I'm very happy to hand over to Andrew Gilmore, our Executive Director for Introductory Remarks. Welcome, Andrew, Andrew and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Katrina. And um, in light of the momentous and horrific aggression that we are currently seeing in Ukraine, I really do thank every participant who's joining us today for, for coming to this. I think it is absolutely essential that the international community doesn't do what it did, for example, after 9-11 in 2001, allowing almost the entirety of it, the bandwidth of its attention to be focused solely on Afghanistan and Iraq and Al-Qaeda and allowing so many other things to fester and not diverting attention from other things. And um, I think it's a vital that we all keep our focus on other matters of huge international importance. And that is what the Berkhoff Foundation will be doing um, in the areas that we are, are working on. And there can be no doubt that Yemen remains either near the very top or indeed at the very top of other international crises um, <clears throat> with 
human, the great humanitarian disaster, perhaps by a time um, with momentous uh, environmental and economic consequences as well. Even if Afghanistan and Ethiopia, other areas where we're involved, are also heading in that direction too. <clears throat> so I'm especially glad that we have this event today because in the last year or so, the Berkhoff Foundation has increasingly been trying to focus on environmental issues and climate change and how they relate to conflict in, in most cases, exacerbating it, but how we could perhaps use these terrible things actually at least to try to promote our peace building agenda. So I am really, really happy about this. So of course, Yemen is facing the possibility of a national ecolo ecological catastrophe that it would be hard to find a comparison for in history. Hence, in our view, the vital importance of today's topic for Yemen and for the Bangkok Foundation, and hence my gratitude to you all for participating in it. Big welcome. Thank you very much to Andrew Gilmore, the Executive Director of the Berkhoff Foundation for his introductory remarks. Now I'd like to give a brief framing of today's event. Firstly, a few words on the Berkhoff Foundation's Yemen program. At the request of national stakeholders, the Political Development Forum Yemen and the Berkhoff Foundation started their close partnership in 2012 by providing technical and process related support to Yemen's national dialogue. However, following the outbreak of the current conflict, now it's been ongoing for more than seven years, our support shifted to seeking a negotiated political solution to the conflict in, in, evolving into the political dialogue support program. The program has developed as an all Yemen approach working across the country's fragmented governance structures. The Yemen unit's work has included since 2012, strengthening inclusive local governance in selected governorates, including Hadramaut, Damar, and Al Mahra. And since 2018, strengthening community safety in Adan, Hadramaut, Sana'a, Ta'iz, and Damar. In 2020, a regional dialogue component was added, meaning that the Yemen unit works on multiple tracks at local, national, and regional levels, all in support of the United Nations-led peace process in Yemen. This work is generously supported by the German, Swedish, and Dutch foreign offices, as well as the European Union. Secondly, it is important to state that all these Yemen unit initiatives are ongoing. Our discussion today on climate and peace building is not intended to supplant these efforts, but rather to highlight the environmental dimensions of the conflict in Yemen. The Yemen unit is increasingly interested in incorporating environmental issues into its programming, especially those springing from Yemeni-led discussions at local and national levels. In December last year, we published our paper entitled Climate Change and Conflict in Hadramaut and Al Mahra, authored by Helen Lackner, one of our panelists today, whose research was based on extensive interviews in both governorates. I would really very much encourage you to read the paper in full after today's event via the link provided in the chat. We've also been working together with another one of today's panelists, Maha Salahi, a researcher at Homa Akhtar, a Yemeni NGO focusing on environmental issues to consider the possible entry points for dialogue at a national level on environmental issues. These issues have not thus far featured prominently in high level discussions regarding the conflict in Yemen. It is however urgent to address this gap because environmental issues arguably stress every aspect of the current situation in the country and its immediate neighborhood from intensifying the humanitarian situation, exacerbating, exacerbating agri agricultural, water, and food scarcity, to contributing to unemployment, displacement, and poverty, as well as deepening gender and socioeconomic divides. The Berkhoff Foundation, as an organization working on conflict transformation, 
is very concerned with these interlinkages between climate and conflict. And we want fellow organizations also to consider the importance of these issues in their own work. The aim of today's event specifically is to explore how these challenges in Yemen could present opportunities for dialogue and cooperation between different parties involved in the conflict. And we are very much looking forward to doing just that today with our excellent lineup of panelists. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function as my colleague Katarina suggested throughout and we'll return to them in the Q&A session later on. You can do that in both English and Arabic. If you want to listen in Arabic or English, please use the interpretation function. More information can be found on how best to do that in the chat if needed. I will now hand back over to Katerina to introduce our panel and to start the discussion. The floor is yours, Katerina. Thanks a lot, Callum, and I'm now really honored to finally introduce our excellent panel of today. And um, I would start with Helen Lechner. Um, Helen is a visiting fellow at the European Council for Foreign Relations and a research associate at SOAS. Her most recent book is Yemen in Crisis, Autocracy, Neoliberalism and the Disintegration of a State. Um, the second edition of this book, along with her new book, Yemen, Poverty and Conflict, will be published in summer. We're looking forward to that. Her earlier career as a rural development consultant took her to more than 30 countries, including Yemen, where she lived for more than 15 years between the 1970s and the 2010s. And as mentioned by Callum, um, she's also the author of our most recent publication on Yemen and conflict change. And it was an honor to work with you on that, Helen. So a very warm welcome to you. Then uh, we have Maha Saleh with us today. Maha is a researcher at the Yemeni environmental NGO Hul Mahdar. She's also a project manager at the Euro-Mediterranean Information System on know-how in the water sector, where she has worked on research and innovation projects addressing issues related to water, agriculture and climate change since 2014. Maha also lectures at Schema Business School in Sofia Antipolis on subjects related to environmental science, policy and sustainability. Welcome and it's great to have you Maha. Now I move to Omar Ben Shihab. Omar is the General Director of the Environmental Protection Authority in Wadi Hadramaut. He's a consultant on integrated water resource management, disaster risk reduction, and environmental water systems. And he has published extensively on water and climate change related topics and contributed to local and regional conferences on water management. Also, I'm very glad to have you here, Omar, because you have been contributing to Helen's research as well as part of a consultation uh, group, and you are part of a committee that Berkhoff works with on local governance and peace building issues in Yemen. So it's an honor to have you with us today. And maybe just a note, he might not be able to turn on his camera because of weak connection issues, so just in case you're wondering who's with us, I hope. Um, and then last but not least, I would like to welcome Abdul Malik Al Ghazali. Um, Abdul Malik is the current chair of the Environmental Protection Agency in Sana'a, so the counterpart in the capital. He has worked for the EPA since 2014 and became its chair in 2018. He has professional practical experience in all aspects of environmental management, including climate change, biodiversity and waste management. He's trained in environmental impact assessment, management of general industrial and medical waste, as well as in the environmental impacts of human behavior and natural events. A warm welcome to you as well, Abdul Malik. All right, now I would like to get us started and have a very first question to you, Helen. Um, if you could give us a short introduction into Yemen's history with climate change and environmental degradation and where you think that climate change had the most impact so far in the food sector, or maybe agriculture, where do you see that it has had the most impact? Over to you, Helen. 
Katarina, thank you so much for your present, for your introduction and such an impressive one. And also very much thanks to the Berkhoff Foundation for organizing this event. I think it's particularly important to look at the environment, environmental issues in relation to conflict, not just in Yemen, but more generally, because although they are not uh, directly immediately connected, I think there's a very fundamental relationship between the increasing problems and stresses in the world and the, and the environmental problems. So now to come to your question directly, giving a short answer is really not easy because they are, it's a really complex uh, situation, but I shall try and be brief. And I think one of the first points to be made is that Yemen alongside many other countries is one of the least producers of greenhouse gases and therefore one of the least countries or its people are amongst the least responsible for the climate change and problems. They are also alongside these other countries, those who are suffering most. And in that sense, you know, there is a very considerable similarity between Yemen and other countries. And when we see the numbers of conflicts which are developing uh, in the third world, as we used to call it, or I'm not quite sure what we call it today, you know, this is a really important factor. And again, the underlying importance of environmental and climate change issues really should become an important element of any peace making efforts or possibly preventing conflict efforts. So very briefly, to look at the situation in Yemen, I think if we look at what has happened in the last half century, we can really see that the environmental issues have started and have increased you know, in a gradual way over that period. And I just wanted to start with the 1970s very briefly because that was a period when for various reasons, which I've gone into various publications, the, the fundamental uh, agroecological system of the Yemeni highlands, namely terrace agriculture, started to seriously deteriorate. Now, if you look at the beautiful pictures of Yemeni terraces, you know, you can also look at the ones that have deteriorated and you can see that once they start deteriorating, you can have a 2000 meter collapse of the whole system, which affects, you know, everybody. And that's one of the elements that started because not only do you, do, do, is the soil lost, and therefore the agricultural land lost, but also the water retention capacity is lost. So, you know, although the most visible element of Yemen's environmental crisis is the water crisis, because that is, you know, today visible, you already have villages that are being, you know, very important uh, changes. You know, you have urban uh, water supply systems which operate uh, extremely infrequently. I mean, I'll just give you the two most crucial examples, which is that in Thais, already in the mid 1990s, the 40% the of households that were, that were connected, I repeat, that were connected to the municipal uh, network, were getting water about once every 40 days. I say 40, four, zero, you know, one and a half months almost. You know, it's more or less the same situation today in Thais, and a lot of things have happened since. And again, I could go on about this for an hour longer, which I won't do. In Sana, you have, you know, you have a water system where water was prior to the conflict distributed about once or twice a week. Um, so, that, you know, the water is the most visible element of the Yemeni environmental crisis. But you have other elements and, you know, which are real. I mean, that the deterioration of terraces was much more a human impact than actually a climate change impact. But the climate change impact has developed over the period with increasing numbers and frequency and severity of both droughts and floods. And therefore, you know, worsening situation, again, increasing uh, the removal of, upper, of agricultural soil. And you have, you know, and all, all these things, of course, have increased poverty. You also have had the rise of, uh, in irrigation system and modern irrigation systems and di diesel pumps, which have increased the 
social differentiation because it, they have privileged, they have allowed the wealthier to have more land and to more irrigated land, while the poorer have been forced basically to sell their land because then shallow wells were no longer operational. So you have a whole host of factors which have you know played a very important role. And although I've emphasized the rural aspect, I think this is important to remember because in Yemen, you still have 70% of the population living in rural areas. So, you know, all the urban problems are relevant. You also have very important rural uh, deterioration. You have the issue of rising sea levels. Now, rising sea levels is not something which is already immediately visible. But it's something that is going to affect, you know, at least three of the Yemen's major cities, if we consider Mukalla a major city, we have Hodeida, Aden and Mukalla, plus, you know, thousands of hundreds of small fisher settlements. So, you know, these are more factors. I don't know how much more time you want to give me because I can also give you a kind of quick rundown of the period of periodization and changes. But I think the, you know, these are really the crucial factors which are important. And maybe you know, Maha will be able to, to answer more details on some of the questions, unless you want to give me more time. Thanks. No, that's, that's a great uh, historical kind of overview to kick off the discussion, Helen. Uh, thank you very much for that. I, I would like to ask Maha Salahi, probably bringing the discussion up to right to the present moment and in the current conflict context, I mean, what do you see as the, a couple of the main economic, uh, main environmental challenges that Yemen faces and, and why? Why are they the main ones in your opinion? Thank you, thank you, Kalom, and, and uh, thank you, Helen, for this uh, inspiring uh, introduction. Uh, well, in my opinion, I think the current uh, three main environmental challenges in Yemen uh, our first, uh, the FSO Safir tanker. Uh, but this challenge shall be dealt differently than the other environmental challenges because first it's urgent and it, it emerged during the, the war. Uh, and it is true that uh, it is not yet an environmental disaster, but it could uh, be not only one of the biggest environmental disasters in Yemen, but also an, in, an, an economic and health one. So for those uh, who don't know, or just as a reminder, uh, the tanker is located at the west coast of Yemen and uh, near to Ras Isa port. And the tanker is at risk of uh, either leakage or explosion. Uh, it holds around 1.1 million uh, barrels of crude oil. And according to the estimates from the United Nations, uh, there could be a $1.5 billion of uh, lost income and cleanup costs over 25 years. Um, this means that thousands of uh, people working in the fishing industry would lose their jobs. Uh, Al Hudayda port, uh, which supplies 70% uh, of populations with essential uh, uh, goods, uh, might be closed for five to six months. This would exacerbate the food insecurity problem as well as the fuel shortage. Um, also, the ecosystems in the Red Sea would be severely damaged, uh, impacting not only Yemen, but also neighboring countries, uh, include, including Djibouti and Saudi Arabia. So the other uh, two challenges that I would briefly also mention, one that was mentioned already uh, by Helen, which is water. So water is, is, is one of the most important challenges because it's not only a survival matter, uh, but it also intersects with other sectors uh, such as agriculture, health, uh, and energy. Uh, also, water issues in Yemen uh, is a matter of uh, availability. So uh, Yemen is uh, one of the most water scarce countries in the world. Um, we don't have permanent rivers. Uh, we depend mainly on underground water and rainfall. But the underground water experiences uh, declining levels. Uh, ranging between three to seven meters per year in critical basins. Uh, also, it's a matter, water is a matter also of quality, um, whether it is drinking water or sanitation and hygiene uh, services. Uh, they are very poor and they have been impacted also by the war, either uh, by reduced uh, services or absence of services. Also, some of the water facilities have been uh, targeted by conflicting parties. 
the inadequate uh, water and sanitation hygiene services have led to several waterborne diseases uh, in Yemen, such as cholera, malaria, dengue fever, and uh, chikungunya in different governorates as well. And this is, was very much experienced during the conflict. Um, also water, uh, it's a matter of accessibility as was mentioned by Helen, because the majority of people, they live in rural areas, but they also, they don't have uh, access to the, uh, uh, um, or they are not connected to water network. And finally, water is also a matter of affordability because those who can afford water, they, they try to get private water tanks to uh, meet their needs of water. And these water tanks are very expensive and the price has skyrocketed during the war, um, especially with the increasing uh, shortages of fuel. Uh, finally, I will just include with the third uh, main uh, challenge, at least in my opinion, it would be natural disasters and extreme events, which are becoming more frequent and more severe uh, due to climate change. So uh, Yemen is highly vulnerable, uh, especially to floods and droughts. Uh, in recent years, uh, flash floods have been experienced in different governorates uh, at an unexpected rate as well. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, destroy, uh, houses which got destroyed. Uh, it, also, there has been limited access to markets and basic services. Uh, many fatalities and uh, diseases also have been uh, caused by these uh, flash floods. Um, and with these consequences, we, we don't only talk about the environment and health, we also talk about the economy. Uh, so for example, there was an interview by Film Akhtar uh, that was uh, made by, with uh, the engineer Alawi Muhammad Abdullah. He is a meteorologist at the Aviation and Meteorological Authority in Aden. And he reported that during the summer of 2020, the estimated losses amounted to $1.9 billion in the provinces of Aden, Habramut, and Lahj alone. So imagine these kind of episodes occurring every year. Uh, it, it makes, with no doubt, uh, climate change as one of the most important uh, priorities we need to be dealt with. And back to you, Katerina. Thank you so much, Maha, and also for bringing up the connection to, to conflicts already. And I think I will have another question to that direction to Omar, Omar bin Shihab. I would like to uh, ask you to give us some idea of how all of this plays out at the local level. And it's great to see you for a minute on the camera. Um, you are from Wadi Hadramaut, um, the inland of the southeastern and actually the biggest governorate of Yemen. And I would like you to tell us a bit more about your home and um, how you see climate change and environmental degradation actually manifesting itself there. And then if you can see any connection to local conflicts. Over to you, Omar. Uh, first, I would like to thank you very much to thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm happy to join you in this uh, in the seminar. Of course, uh, the environmental issues in Hadramaut and especially in the Wadi uh, 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 are yeah, they have not been as a center of focus or attention in the past, and, and unfortunately, it's being exacerbated every day. Uh, one of the most important issue is the the pollution, desertification, and the increasing temperature, uh, and the fl flash floods, which are threatening the population. Uh, so th these these problems, especially the flash floods, have, have had a major impact uh, to the infrastructure, and they have de they destroyed uh, uh, house, housing and roads. Uh, and uh, and and had uh, created a number of uh, uh, diseases uh, that, that re related to the flash floods. Uh, many of the families who have been impacted by the floods, uh, they, they, they now when their children when 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 they when they when they find uh, uh, that, that that there are uh, overcasty uh, weather and all that, uh, the, the the children suffer from 
from uh, uh, psychological problems. Uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the problems in Hadramaut uh, is also the uh, the deterioration of the of the soils uh, uh, and uh, and the soil ero erosion as well as uh, the destruction of the historic cities. Uh, in many of the historic cities in Hadramaut have been impacted as a result of the flash flood. These flash floods have also increased the levels of poverty and uh, and uh, and the biggest uh, ch ch challenge uh, uh, since uh, that the 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 uh, rainfall uh, fo focus on the plateaus and in the plateaus uh, there is the oil exploration activities and with the existence of the waste of oil exploration has led to uh, to the, uh, a major impact on agricultural areas in the in the and the Hadramaut and the wadis and and this is an negatively impacting, especially with the increasing of the level of disease, including cancers and uh, the uh, uh, blood diseases. Uh, this is, in, in general, uh, the, the problems related to the flash floods. And one of the most important uh, problems uh, in the Hadramaut, according to the reports, especially those uh, produced by the water and environment centers, uh, that the uh, the uh, water depletion, uh, the water, groundwater depletion, is now uh, seven times the uh, the the re replenishing uh, process, and this is uh, uh, leading to the depletion of groundwater with a weakness of development. Uh, there there uh, there is importance uh, uh, the, the surveys uh, that have been conducted. Uh, uh, confirm that, that there is also a high level of pollution. I lost the sound. And and the 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Wadi Hadramaut as well as in, in Hadramaut in in general has led to the in, in, in increasing of the water pollution, uh, especially now that the, the drilling of water uh, wells has, has gone as deep as eighty meters, uh, and this has uh, caused a uh, major pollution to the groundwater, and this requires uh, major interventions. Uh, uh, Pollution and the depletion of groundwater and climate change uh, have are becoming uh, uh, more frequent, and uh, and we are now suffering from those uh, uh, problems, uh, and we are also suffering from the uh, oil production uh, uh, projects, uh, and we also have uh, problems related to the disposal of waste, uh, especially solid waste. There are many issues uh, that that can be mentioned, uh, especially related to the environment. Thank you very much, Omar ben uh, 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 Is he continuing? Thank you very much for your insights on the local level from Wadi Hadramaut, especially for linking a couple of the, the points that Maha has already stated on a general level with natural disasters and, and water scarcity. I'd like to turn now to Abdul Malik Al Ghazali. Thank you very much for joining us today. Could you maybe give us a, a perspective from where you are in Sana on how, what are the environmental challenges and how are these uh, challenges discussed and addressed where you are? In the name of God, most merciful, most compassionate, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to join this very important webinar. Uh, the, the, of course, the, 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 the environmental challenges are major, especially given the existing conflict. And some of these challenges are the climate change and its impact on groundwater and on agricultural land. Uh, our country has faced many disasters, uh, such as flash floods and hurricanes. Without having to, uh, and, and we have, and also uh, uh, soil erosion and the burying of the uh, antiquities uh, and uh, destruction of historic cities. Uh, the uh, other challenge that we are facing is the lack of oil derivatives which is leading to a number of uh, environmental problems, including the accumulation of waste, uh, which is increasing the spread of diseases and the access to clean water. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, 
and the and the hospitals and health centers, which has led to increasing fatalities. Uh, the, the there is also an, a, a deterioration in the uh, re, natural reserve, and there is an increase uh, of wood collection for uh, uh, use as fuel, uh, and, and these uh, is, is causing destruction of our res natural reserve and uh, and the ecosystems in those areas. Uh, the other point that was mentioned by Maha Salahi, which is uh, the sulfur tanker which may cause a major uh, marine pollution disaster. Uh, we also uh, have also the the, the problem of uh, uh, of uh, uh, hunting uh, uh, rare uh, uh, animal species uh, and marine species, uh, and this recently is a recent phenomena, uh, uh, and we also are facing in general uh, the, the 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 lack of help by from international organization, whether material or moral support to the area, uh, despite the fact that we are are implementing our obligations towards these international organizations as well as, as international conventions. Well, some of the problems, uh, uh, especially, especially the the. the the uh, 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 prohibited pesticides, uh, and there is an an, inc an, inc an inc increase uh, uh, on uh, smuggling of these uh, dangerous um, uh, substances, uh, and uh, they are becoming dangerous uh, a dangerous phenomena. These are the key um, uh, environmental challenges, and there have been uh, 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 challenges that have been mentioned by other colleagues. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abdul Malik, and uh, to all of the panelists. Um, we have heard about a lot of challenges now, and um, of course, we are we are interested to see what are also opportunities or how can we deal with these challenges. And I mean, many of you have alluded to it. Of course, a seven-year war doesn't make it easier to deal with these challenges, and also not having a unified government and a framework in which to implement regulations, uh, maybe not a functioning law enforcement uh, makes it very difficult to address these issues. But we would like to hear from you if you have any ideas, what can be actually done even in this difficult circumstances at the local level to address some of these issues. And I put this question to the floor of all panelists, um, whoever feels, has an impetus, may go first. I see a hand by Helen, like, please go. <laughs> I think first I want to thank my co-panelists because between us, we've, I think, covered a lot of the territory, if not all of it. And particularly Maha for mentioning the issue of the Safer, which of course is a, you know, is a potentially seriously explosive issue for the whole of the Red Sea region. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, to answer the point you were just making, which is when it comes to what can be done, I think it's really important to to do make a distinction between climate change issues on the one hand and other general environmental issues. I mean, there are certain environmental issues, you know, which can be addressed today by people everywhere, and to some extent they already are. I mean, let's, you know, just simply things like. Uh, garbage disposal, uh, particularly plastics. I mean, just to make, to lighten the atmosphere a bit. When I first went to what was then the Yemen Arab Republic, at drive, driving around, one got the impression that there were this whole new type of flowers coming on various cacti and reds and blues and yellows. And when you got close, you realized they were plastic bags that were being, that, you know, were stuck on. Later on, they disappeared. People started sorting out, but this whole you know, development of industrially produced garbage, which does not degenerate on its own, you know, it does not compost like vegetables, fruit, etc. You know, that's been a big problem. Garbage has been a, a, and pollution. And I think, you know, many of the people when we were doing the report on Hadramut and Mahra brought this up. So that's something that can be addressed. Um, you know, war or no war, it can be addressed at the community level, it can be addressed even at the policy level by the different governments. 
Whereas, you know, other issues such as things like uh, raising sea levels is really, you know, <laughs> there's not much the Yemenis can do about that. That's something that has to be addressed at the world level. And, you know, I think those of us who are not so optimistic about the results of COP26, you know, don't feel very optimistic about what can be done about it. So I think if we're having that conversation about, you know, what can be done, let's, let's look separately at what Yemenis can do or what people involved with Yemen can help with and what really remains in the framework of the world international development. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I think I saw a hand by Abdul Malik. If I'm right, then yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to clarify uh, to the, uh, the, 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 the speaker, uh, the, the, you know, for, for instance, for, for addressing the small problems such as waste disposal, etc. I think the problem that we are facing now, yes, we are, we have the capacity to do that. But however, the, the when we import any machines or any thing that will help us do that, they are being prevented. We are being prohibited from importing such equipment. I think the way forward is peace and, and, and that environmental issues should be neutralized and should be dealt in, 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 in uh, without without consideration to the conflict. So uh, maybe uh, it is recommended. Sorry, I was in the Arabic uh, channel. So uh, uh, it is recommended uh, to include climate change as part of the humanitarian and development plan uh, in order to better coordinate actions and link. Uh, the, the two between like climate change and humanitarian climate change and development plans. And I'd like to highlight uh, the importance of continuing the development process in Yemen, uh, and not only to focus on the humanitarian emergency aid uh, in order for the change to be sustainable. Uh, and something else, uh, just to recall, uh, like to echo what uh, uh, Mr. Abdul Malik Al Ghazali has mentioned about the funding. So uh, in the paper that we wrote uh, to Bergov, uh, we tried to have different interviews with those working in development and uh, the environmental sectors. And they all complained that it's really hard to get the funding, uh, even though it is available, especially for uh, vulnerable countries like Yemen. But the, the process is very complicated and it's very long. So something can be done to how to get this funding and implement adaptation uh, projects and initiatives in Yemen. Thank you both, Abdul Malik and Maha. Um, I'm not sure if Omar, you also want to come in on, on this question with your perspective from ha Wadi Hadramaut. For the solutions, uh, actually we are seeing disasters in Wadi Hadramaut and the vast majority of these disasters are surprising to us, actually are shocking and uh, some of them are unexpected. And therefore, we as uh, local authorities in the local sphere are trying to establish a unit for climate change and early warning. And this early warning unit will be useful to uh, mitigate or to reduce the human losses and uh, the infrastructure losses, and this can help us. It's uh, very important to establish this unit in Sana'a, for example, they have an early warning unit that was established. And uh, because Wadi Hadramaut is the area in the Republic of Yemen that is mostly affected by climate change, by disasters, floods, flash floods, and other disasters, it's uh, very important to establish a unit there. Sadly, uh, we have seen some damages that were inflicted to the area since 2008, and until now, these damages were not addressed. We have, we have seen recent damages in Tarim, for example, in the past Ramadan, and all these damages accumulate, and the poorest households are mostly affected. This is something. The other thing 
if it is possible to benefit uh, from the experiences of other uh, countries similar to Yemen and neighboring countries, this can be useful to us. For example, we have the Sultanate of Oman. They are very successful in mitigating these uh, risks uh, and the climate change, and all these things can help us. In addition to that, we require capacity building. Sadly, although these issues are more uh, frequent recently, and uh, these disasters are becoming more severe and the local authorities are facing all this and they do not have the capacities and the resources to do that. But if we have the prior planning, for example, and uh, preparations and readiness, uh, for example, and equipping the early warning units, uh, this will mitigate the problems and the risks we are facing. This is my opinion and these are proposals for the solution. As for so that's it from my side and later on i may add other things thank you and thank you very much omar for those solution orientated reflections uh, perhaps i ask a similar uh, question to the one katarina has just posed but in a slightly different way i mean we have representatives from different parts of yemen here today I mean, what opportunities do the panel see for potential dialogue on environmental challenges, issues, issues related to climate change at both national and local levels in Yemen, given the current uh, situation? This is for everybody, so please do feel free to come in. Uh, okay, I'll start maybe. Although, I mean, it's, it's really great to have in the panel two uh, representatives from different parties that they can share their own uh, experience of how this can be made. But from, uh, from the conclusions that were uh, uh, gathered uh, in our uh, latest paper, uh, and it was already mentioned also by uh, Mr. Omar, is focusing on capacity building, training, and information exchange between two sides of the country. Um, so something that can be done is to gather the technical staff from the uh, EPAs or the Ministry of uh, Water Environment and try to, to, to have discussions and train them and see where collaboration can be made. So this can be an entry point for the national dialogue and national collaboration. Thank you very much, Maha. I believe Omar had his hand up and wanted to come in. Um, maybe it's also a good opportunity to give the audience uh, an idea about what the Environmental Protection Authority is in the Yemeni conflict, both from Wadi Hadramaut and Sana, if that's possible. The solutions that are possible concerning the dialogue, when there is the common foundation to address the environmental issues. The environmental issues are humanitarian issues, and therefore we need to establish a common foundation. A member of the consultative uh, committee working with the Birghoff Foundation through the PDF. So we have worked in three governorates in uh, Mahara Hadramaut, uh, and we have had a number of meetings, and uh, we exchanged the experiences and the opinions uh, so we met with each other and we have uh, examined different perspectives as a joint team aiming at serving the communities. So this is very important. If we have a common cause that is very important for the people, for the environment and the country, I believe it will be easy to come together if we have the good faith and the intentions and we can work together to find solutions. Thank you very much, Omar. Does anybody else, perhaps Abdul Malik, want to come in on this question regarding potential opportunities for, for, for dialogue uh, among different Yemenis on this issue? Uh, 
نعم اخي احنا yes. نعمل كفنانين فروم اور سايد وي ار وركينج از تكنيكال بيبل وي ار نوت بوليتيسايزد وي دو نوت ديستينغويش بين صنعاء ذمار تعز اب ايدن حضرموت سو وي ار ون تيم وي ار ون تيم وي ار تراينج تو بروتكت ذا انفايرمنت وي ار وركينج تو ميتيجيت كلايمت تشينج اند تو ادابت تو ات وي ار تراينج تو بروتكت يمن اند اي بيليف وي هاف نو اوبجيكشن ات اول وي كان ميت ويز ايتش اذر وي كان ديسكاس ات وي can take uh, some common approaches uh, and we adopt decisions and uh, we work together in certain approaches and this will support the uh, political rapprochement because environment is about peace, it's about security. If the environmental issues are apoliticized, I believe that we can have a sooner political solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdul Malik. Uh, Helen, do you have a reflection on this question? Please go ahead if you do. No, I think this question is really best left to Yemenis to talk to each other. So I haven't said anything. <laughs> Thank you. Very well said. Um, I think that we can perhaps start the, the Q&A session, get some questions from the audience. Um, maybe I, I start this one off by asking, we've talked about a lot of in uh, how climate change and, and conflict affect Yemenis as a whole, but how are these uh, effects, how, what are the gender perspectives to these uh, this, um, environmental issues in, in Yemen? How, how do um, these issues affect men and women and youth groups differently in, in Yemen? This is a question for, for everybody. Please go ahead, Helen. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's very clear, particularly when it comes to issues of domestic water collection. Domestic water collection in rural areas is basically done basically by women and children, and it involves, it can involve up to two or three hours of hard labor every day, walking to a well, collecting, carrying it on your head or loading your donkeys and bringing it up. And even where there is water distributed to the houses, you know, women are the ones who have to limit it, to have to use it. They are the ones who are most affected by water issues. When it comes to day-to-day -day agricultural tasks, again, you know, women are involved in the most tired, tedious and day-to-day -day activities. So that's where, you know, their labor and their weakness as a result of extra work is really affecting women more. Water availability, again, it, kids who are busy collecting water are not at school. Uh, women who are busy collecting water are not earning an income. So that's one of the aspects where, you know, gender, and of course, when you're looking at disasters and floods, particularly floods, I mean, you know, it's usually the women and the children who do the clearing up. And yes, the men are involved, but basically, you know, women are particularly affected by, by those particular aspects, whereas the general, I think, climate change aspects are really affecting most people pretty similarly. I'm sure other colleagues can add to this. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And I would very much encourage the audience to keep their questions and comments coming in using the Q&A function. Our, our colleagues in the Yemen unit, Amira and Ramzi, are doing a great job in getting them to us. So please do keep them coming in. Abdul Malik, you seem to want to add to this question. Please go ahead. Yes, I just want to add uh, to what Helen said. She talked about water and agriculture or farming. And uh, women also have hard labor in collecting firewood uh, with the lack of cooking gas in the country. Women spend probably three or four hours a day collecting firewood in order to cook for their families. So uh, this is also time consuming activity. Did, did Maha or Omar want to come in on this question? Helen seems to want to come in also. Maybe Omar or Maha first. I, I saw Helen, she wanted to, to come on, but I, I, I have uh, nothing more to add. I think it's just the role of women in the Yemeni society, they're the ones who are responsible of household chores, who they're like preparing food, uh, providing water. And, and because of this uh, society's role definition, that's why women have bear the responsibility or it's affected the most on them. 
Please go ahead, Omar. You seem to have unmuted yourself. Go ahead. The impacts of the flash floods and the climate change affect directly women in the country, especially as many households that were uh, displaced uh, in the country, for example, women and girls, they cannot go to school. Households cannot send their girls uh, to study because they have lost their uh, shelter and their homes. So these are adverse impacts that we are seeing every day. Helen, did you want to add something else on this before passing back to Katerina for another question from the audience? Yeah, very quickly, I want to thank Abdul Malik for reminding us about uh, firewood, because that's a really important one. And on that one, I'll take a minute to tell, tell you people a story about 1982 in Gaulan, where we had a small project with women. And one day we saw some women walking home with large, large bundles on their backs. And we gave them a lift in the car because there was just me and another woman, so we were driving. And those bundles contained cacti, the last remaining items that could be burned for firewood at a time when there was a big drought going on in Gaulan. And so this is not a new problem because since then there's been a lot more situations where gas has been available, but now people are having to return to you know, collecting firewood. So I really want to thank Abdul Malik for reminding us of this point. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you and uh, shedding some light on, on the gendered aspects of this as well. Um, we're getting in some interesting questions from the audience and there is one um, that is to Omar particularly, but that, that I find also interesting from this um, local perspective and how it can be translated potentially to the national level. So I'm just gonna read it out. Um, in relation to waste management issues in Hadramaut and other governorates, do you think officials, so local authorities and relevant ministries and the community are actually ready to take steps towards engaging in finding and implementing sustainable solutions for this environmental issue? And for example, turning waste to energy or fertilizer sources. Um, so do you see that there is willingness and motivation to do so? And then in a second step, um, how could this play a role in conflict resolution on the national level? So how can kind of the activism at the local level potentially be helpful for finding more overarching solutions? I guess it's first of all to Omar, but also if other panelists have an idea, please come in. For the waste management at the local level, Absolutely. Uh, some projects were presented to us by some investors for waste management, solid waste management, and we have found we, we were very responsive to them. We provided them with lands, but uh, sadly, their projects were not fully implemented. Uh, the uh, local authorities, uh, with their efforts to work on this problem, I believe we can resolve it. Uh, so uh, the local authorities will be very receptive if there are any initiatives or projects uh, in this regard. Concerning resolving issues at the local level and the impact of that on the national level, well, we continually uh, present our issues and problems to the central authorities and they help us in these solutions, but the vast majority of the solutions are implemented at the local level, local sphere, and we do hope to have this connection to the central level. The line is breaking. So these uh, solid waste materials are uh, thrown in different parts of the country and into the sea and uh, floods uh, flush them into agricultural lands and this affects the fertility of the lands uh, and uh, therefore I do think we need recycling projects uh, and there is a broad acceptance for these solutions if implemented. Thank you very much. Um, any other thoughts on this question? Any other panelists? Okay. 
if not, I would hand over back. Ah, Abdul Malik, yes. Tafadal Abdul Malik. Malik. Did you want to come in, Abdul Malik? Yes, uh, thank you. For the solid waste management, it is a very important issue. And we started by conducting a workshop and we invited all the investors to have investments in this uh, field for the uh, recycling in, of waste materials and produce energy. So we have uh, prepared some project proposals, uh, but we did not receive funding. They were uh, presented to the uh, Green Climate Fund. And until now, we are unable to communicate directly with them because of the war and the conflict in the country. And we are about to resolve the issue of the plastic waste. We have started the early stages uh, in uh, removing the uh, manufacturing of the undegradable plastic bags, and we are continuing these steps. Uh, may I add something as well? I think we also need a lot of awareness campaigns uh, to raise the importance of, you know, putting the waste in the bins, in the like among the populations themselves. Because we go to the streets in Yemen, everywhere you have plastics and and garbage. So this is this is not only the responsibility of authorities, but I think it's also a community level effort that needs to be improved. I have another question from the audience, this time from Abir, um, who asked something which has kind of been touched on a, a couple of times already and asks, in your opinion, why is it so difficult for Yemen to access available global funds, particularly for climate adaptation, despite meeting the criteria for those in need of immediate support? And there's another kind of related question about expectations from the international community on this issue for Yemen and, and international development efforts. So that's free for anybody to take up. Uh, maybe I can start uh, just based on the, the answers from the interviews that we have conducted in the paper. So it was not with the authorities, it was with development uh, organizations, uh, such as the Social Development Fund. And what we have gathered as feedback is that the, the process of applying for this funding, it's very long and complicated. So sometimes they need technical support on how to get to this uh, funding, if it's uh, and the public uh, development organizations. But when it comes to authorities, I think it's because of the word that we have this division between the government. Sometimes to get to the funding, we need the, like a representative governmental body. So from the conflict points of view, it complicates the, the, the acquisition of these fundings. Maybe uh, Mr. Abdul Malik or Omar can, uh, can give us more information because they're, they're part of the EPA. Um, please go ahead, Helen. You seem to have your hand up. Yeah, I think I want to to follow up on something that. Yeah, you want to read on what about the مسألة التي ذكرتها مها. Sorry, Abdul Malik. You can come in after Helen. Please go ahead, Helen. Sorry, I'm getting confused. As I thought, we're two of us speaking at the same time. So what I wanted to say is really, I think this issue is actually connected with what uh, Maha mentioned earlier, which is the topic that I've been pushing now for so many years that I can't remember, which is that focus of investment should be much more on development. And when we're looking at the moment at funding for in Yemen, it's almost exclusively, I think it's now about 85% of funding for Yemen is humanitarian. And you have a very bureaucratic division within the funding agencies between humanitarian and development. So the fact that, you know, most of the kind of activities we're talking about really should be developmental activities. And therefore, because funding is much more focused on, you know, food distributions and emergency aspects, you know, there's very little funding uh, available for these types of 
investments. At the same time, I think it's important to note that the, you know, the funding issue is not just a Yemeni issue. If you're looking at the funding agencies worldwide, and you know they're de reducing the amounts of fund available overall at the time when actually demand and need for humanitarian, let alone development funds, is increasing uh, worldwide. And I think all we can say now is that with what happened in Afghanistan and what's happening in Afghanistan today since the summer, and what's likely to happen now in, in Europe in coming months, you know, funding situation is likely to become worse rather than better. So over to Abdul Malik. Thank you. Uh, 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 yes, uh, th thank you. What what Helen has has said, I, that's what I wanted to mention in the beginning in my first point. The second point, it, it, it is that there is a division, uh, especially within the uh, international donor organization, and specifically the environmental organizations. We in Sana'a, we face a challenge when we uh, correspond with this organization based on the agreements. Uh, they 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 refuse our our application that they want the other side to agree uh, so uh, so there is a problem either the either the organization or the agreements uh, should should actually come up with a solution if they have funding for yemen uh, they, they, they should not deprive any one region uh, either they could allocate the 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 funding either 50 50 or at what any percentage uh, or, or or they could have the two delegations, one from the first party and one and the other one from the second party, so that no one part of Yemen would be deprived from this funding. Because when any party is deprived, whether the southern area or the northern area uh, are deprived from the funding, then they face problems. Uh, and the impact will be will, will, will actually impact the other side as well. Uh, so so like, like we said, there's one ecosystem, one environment, uh, and we have to deal with that uh, we have to deal with it with this kind of uh, uh, with, with this notion. Thank you very much, Abdul Malik. Uh, 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 maybe Omar, you want to come in on this expectations from the international community on support for addressing environmental challenges? Well, the issues related to the international community are, re are relevant to the central authorities who are communicating with the organizations. Uh, as far as we're concerned, we deal with, with, with things at the local level and we work within the local areas only. But uh, in recent times, uh, we have started working with a number of United Nations organizations uh, especially in, in, in climate management and early warning systems uh, uh, and uh, the the mitigation of natural of the impacts of natural resources we we we, we have contributed in training 140 people and we increased awareness to, to nearly 1000 people all these are ac actions uh, that have been supported by united nations organizations who have contributed uh, to giving uh, uh, the the, the uh, aware of uh, disseminating awareness uh, to, to the local community and uh, forging a relationship between us and the communities in order to resolve to address uh, the problems especially related to the early warning system for uh, uh, flash floods uh, that's uh, with respect to the local level but uh, but but uh, dealing with international organizations especially those working in the environment this is something to do with the central authorities Thank you so much, everyone, for your inputs on these questions. Um, I would like to pick up another kind of stream of questions that came in. I think on the one hand, there was um, a, a bit of wish for more examples or details on, on the nexus between conflict and climate change or environmental issues. I know many of you have touched upon it, but maybe we can give a few more concrete examples and then Looking at that, there were some questions on in how far on the one hand armed actors are influencing 
conflict and environmental degradation, but might also play a positive role in some way. So what is the role of armed actors in all of this? And then uh, maybe also moving away from conflict more towards peace building and conflict resolution. Are there any good examples that you are aware of where mediation efforts or conflict resolution efforts have been climate sensitive? or where climate adaptation has been used as a tool for mediation on the local level or the national level. So I know these are almost three points in one that I'm raising here, but uh, opening this up for, for a larger discussion. Alan, please go ahead. Sounds like no one's very inspired on this one. I think you have a lot of situations where mediation can deal with environmental issues at a local level. I mean, for example, if you have conflicts between two communities over a well digging or something of that kind, you know, mediation can very easily, and there are historical examples of this having been done over the past few decades. I think Gerhard Lichtenthaler is the main person who's written a lot about that and who was involved in such work in, in Amran particularly. So at that level, you know, it's very clear that there is room for easy, not easy, but room for mediation and compromise and organize and sorting out problems between two communities over a particular local resource. I think at the much more general level, at the national level, it's much more difficult um, to, to, to do, to connect these aspects. So I think I leave it to others to continue. Maybe while I've been talking, they've been inspired. Uh, maybe just some points about the link between conflict and the environment. So uh, in many cases, conflicts are uh, emerged because of the uh, disputes over the natural resources. So even in Yemen, even before the conflict, there were some recorded uh, tribal conflicts over water wells and so on. So, and even now, for example, the, the current um, situation in Yemen, most of the uh, focus is in Ma'rib and Shabwa where there are natural resources. So there is a, a, a direct link between the conflict and uh, natural resources, whether it is water or you know, fossil fuels or you name it. And at the same time, as the conflict is happening, the, 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 the pressure over the natural resources are even exacerbated. So it's like a cycle, like a feedback loop. Like the more there's a, a feedback, a, a conflict, uh, the uh, harder it is to govern uh, the, the environment. Any additional thoughts by Omar or Abdul Malik or any points also on, on the role of armed actors in environmental degradation? Yes, Abdul Malik, you're raising your hand. Please go ahead. In, in addition to the conflicts over water resources and natural resources, uh, there are also conflicts uh, uh, related to, to 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 the lack of finding uh, uh, waste disposal dumps and also uh, san sanit sanitation or sewer treatment plant. Uh, and now the the the, the, lo the local com communities uh, do, do not agree for the establishment of these projects and this is crea creating even more conflicts because they don't want to allow the building of sewage uh, plants and, uh, and other water uh, and other waste disposal projects. So to address directly the issue of armed aspects, of course, you know, there's a major impact on the environment and on people's living of landmines spread all over the country, which are preventing people from cultivating, let alone killing people and damaging people. And also the whole issue of unexploded ammunition. And we don't know what kind of chemicals and other you know, dangerous products have been spread around the country by, by exploded bombs and other people. I mean, I really don't know. I'm not a chemist. I don't know any of the technicality. But I think these are all major issues that are affecting, you know, both the environment and people's health and are likely to do so for a long time to come. 
I mean, simply the history of mines and mine clearance in, in Yemen and elsewhere in the world, you know, they're things that create problems for decades thereafter. So I think that's def very definitely an impact of, uh, of armed intervention. Thanks. Yeah, uh, and just to add uh, to Helen is that there are uh, there were some uh, mines that were dislocated or dislocated or located somewhere else because of the fl uh, flash floods. So that's also another interlink between the two. Yeah, the, I think the mines were never mapped in the first place, so <laughs> they've been all over the place. But you're quite right; they've been going down the wadis and and you know creating new problems in places where they weren't before. So yeah. Yeah, thank you both for raising that. And I think I've seen Omar unmuting himself in between. So please, please come in. Uh, the, the, the fear from the impact of the conflict is the, the, the impact of uh, the, uh, the oil installation because it will have a very uh, risk, risky, uh, r r r r risky impact. Uh, 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 especially the sulfur, the, the sulfur oil tanker, this will have a negative impact. And in, in the uh, Hadramaut Wadi Hadramaut, there are also many uh, oil storage tankers, especially in Marib and in Qaj'a. Uh, there are many oil storage tankers and any um, uh, 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 um, impact on, the, on those will create uh, major uh, uh, problems. And therefore there should be uh, an, uh, the, the, the there should be a neutralization of these uh, vital institutions from the conflict. Thanks a lot. So I'll, I'll hand over to Callum for a next question from the audience. Well, there's, there's still a lot of questions coming in and I will attempt to do what you've done, Katerina, and group a couple. There's a question on uh, for, for the panelists on aquifers is there anything specific that you think that could be realistically done with limited resources given the current conflict and political challenges to slow or to reverse the exhaustion of yemenis uh, yemen's aquifers somewhat related is a, is another question on are there any opportunities to work with mediation and um resolution of resource disputes and um, Maha you mentioned water as an entry point for uh, joint peace building because water water basins cut across uh, conflict lines Is, are there any opportunities for doing just that and on something not directly related to water I think there was a very important question about um, there seems to be a lot of attention in peace building efforts that is focused on international state actors, it seems as though local Yemeni voices are inadvertently getting silenced. What are practical ways uh, that Ye local Yemeni voices can be elevated, and I would say on, on the environment as uh, other issues may be talking about civil society engagement with uh, environmental issues. So that's a, a couple of questions to the panelists. Feel, feel free to come in. I'll be very quick. There's a simple solution to the water problem. Give priority to people's domestic needs, to livestock, and control agricultural use. Because if you reduce agricultural use by 10%, you're basically making water available for domestic and other purposes. Of course, the other aspect that needs to be addressed is that the distribution of water and the problems where they are, they are the, the problems of the distribution of water do not coincide either with water basins or with population groups or with density of population. So no, um, you know, no one size fits all recipe can operate. You need to have very specific different approaches in each specific circumstances, local level and at the basin level. And I think, you know, one of the things that was raised at the national dialogue was the issue of, you know, regions to, to the extent to which, uh, to, to the limited extent to which it's possible, because it isn't possible totally to, to have regions coinciding with uh, water availability and water basins. Um, I think if you look at the aquifers, I think that's another issue, but maybe Maha has more to add on that. Thank you. 
Okay, so when it comes to uh, water, like what can be done? I think we, we need to apply the do not harm approach when delivering emergency aid and support to Yemen because there was uh, some negative impacts about the uh, pumps uh, solar so, uh, that are empowered by the solar uh, energy. So that was one of the reasons why the water was extracted even uh, more than before. Uh, also, uh, Yemenis have been good with the non-conventional water resources, so rainwater harvesting, uh, yet uh, many sites need to be um, renovated. So I think if we focus on non-commercial water resources, it could be one of the options, especially that a majority of people live in rural areas. Uh, but also, we mentioned before that uh, one of the most impacts of climate change is the flash floods. So something needs to be done with the storage of water. I think a lot of water it just goes there and uh, it's mixed with the sewage water, but more needs to be done into storage of water and using it sustainably. Thank you all very much to the panelists for great responses and to the audience for great Man, questions. Please go ahead, Abdul Malik. I just want to add uh, concerning the aquifers, in addition to the previous question, there is the issue of the water pollution and contamination with the radioactive materials and the accumulation of the remnants of uh, explosives and shells and uh, missiles, and all this affects the environment significantly. Please go ahead, Omar. As for the slowing the extraction of water from the aquifers, it's a very important issue. Wadi Hadramaut is a basin, it's a very big basin or aquifer, and it is one of the most important wadis or valleys in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, and it is uh, water rich. And this was uh, confirmed by uh, some Canadian studies. And therefore, the study focused on maintaining the artisan facilities concerning the flood irrigation. And this will increase uh, the water levels and it will reduce or mitigate the adverse impacts, especially concerning quality. And another thing is to use uh, modern irrigation techniques uh, using solar energy, for example, and uh, the uh, electrical pumps. This will have a good impact, but this will, may result in more extraction of groundwater. But if we combine it with modern irrigation techniques, it will help. The other issue is the transnational uh, water, and this requires uh, some interventions, and we need here to build the capacity on how to deal with that, especially in Wadi Hadramaut. Wadi Hadramaut is connected to different parts of the Arabian Peninsula, and therefore we need to understand what is happening in all these areas. So uh, there must be dialogue and discussion, conversation at the local level and at the regional level as well. Thank you very much, Omar. Did anybody want to come in on the point of in including more local Yemeni voices in the, in the peace process related to environmental issues, perhaps giving an indication of, of civil society's response to these issues. Um, my comment would be that civil society's uh, organizations need to be more empowered. Uh, I think they have an important role yet they, they need more empowerment, whether it is with the training or funding or just the um, making their voices heard. We can hand back then to Katerina for perhaps another last question from the audience. Um, yeah, there have been many. It's so difficult to pick. I want to take the chance and, and thank you all already for your lovely participation. I think we've received more than 70 messages. So um, I, I try to choose one um, 
And there was one that I that I found interesting, actually. It's a, it's a single issue. It won't open up a whole can of other questions. So maybe we go with that. Um, there was a question whether the environmental protection authorities are actually in touch with um, the ministries of education to include climate and environmental issues in the curricula. So kind of like a forward thinking. And there was also a comment or a remark that in schools, there should be more rescue awareness and practice sessions in, in light of um, yeah, increasing environmental disasters. Um, so I just wanted to give that to Omar and, and Abdul Malik to respond to, but maybe to also reflect more generally on, on the interlinkages between climate change and education sector. Well, in fact, uh, for environment and education, we are in contact with the Ministry of Education. We presented to them different proposals to add the environmental aspects to the curriculum. And the APA established a club for the environment friends in every school. So we have environmental activities with these clubs uh, and we give them assignments to have the school radio for example and to spread the awareness uh, through the school uh, radio over and i think we might have lost Omar due to the connection i'm afraid at least he's not uh -huh. Uh, sorry, I lost uh, communication because of the poor connectivity. Anyway, what I understood from the question is the role of the civil society organizations. It's about the role of civil society organizations in the educational field. In the, in the past week, for example, we have celebrated the National Environment Day, and we started from schools. And we met with the young people and uh, encouraged them to protect the environment. This is a very important issue because what we do today in terms of environment protection is for them, is for the future generations. And uh, therefore, whenever we protect the environment more, we make it more sustainable and this sustainability will affect them. For uh, the civil society organizations, tomorrow I will have a workshop concerning this topic. Uh, and uh, it is with the CSOs. It's about uh, the experiences of CSOs in uh, protecting the environment. So tomorrow we will have a session tomorrow at this same time. I will be discussing the role of CSOs in protecting the environment and the joint work between the EPA and CSOs in this field. And uh, therefore I can confirm that CSOs are very important. They are connecting between the government and the citizens, the people, and therefore they can be very helpful in reducing the suffering, alleviating the suffering, and they uh, form the linkages between the citizens and the authorities, and they convey the issues of citizens to the government, especially those related to environment and water. Over. Thank you very much, Omar. I think that probably draws the end of today's event uh, for matters of time, uh, although the questions seem to be continuing to flood in. So it falls to me to briefly conclude. And what struck me about today's discussion was how multifaceted uh, Yemen and its relationship to the environment in the current context, conflict context is. It's really a topic which deserves more than an hour and a half of our attention on a, on a Wednesday afternoon. So we really do hope to keep the, the discussion going in, in a couple of different venues. I mean, the Berghoff Foundation is very interested in uh, continuing that discussion. But if you feel that your question was not in, uh, was not answered today, we're very happy to follow up with you. If you send an email to the following address, yemen at berghoff-foundation.org. I would also, after hearing uh, Helen's wonderful contributions today, very much encourage you to read our paper on uh, climate change and conflict in Hadramaut and Al-Mahra, authored by Helen. The link should be in the chat. 
Thank you very much to Andrew Gilmore, our Executive Director, for his introductory remarks. Thank you to the interpreters for the excellent work today, helping us reach uh, this event to Yemenis and our Yemeni colleagues. And of course, to all my colleagues in comms and the Yemen unit here at Berghof, especially for, uh, to Ramzi and Amira for giving us the, the questions, highlighting them for us. Thank you very much to you, the audience, for, for your interest and for your questions. And, and last but not least, obviously, I would like to really warmly thank our, our brilliant lineup of panelists for, for a very stimulating discussion today. Thank you to Helen Lackner, Maha Salahi, Omar Ben Mohammed Shahab, and Abdul Malik Al Ghazali. If you've enjoyed today's event today, I would encourage you to please sign up to the Burkhoff Foundation's newsletter. The link should be in the chat to keep up to date with all of our upcoming events, including all the information on another planned event about conflict, climate change, and gender to be announced soon. Our next event, however, is tomorrow. That's Thursday, the 3rd of March at three o'clock um, Central European time entitled how to prevent escalation, a panel discussion with activists and experts on nonviolent resistance, a very timely topic indeed, moderated by my colleague, Dr. Veronique Dudoué, our senior advisor for conflict transformation research. Please join if you can. Thank you all very much once again. I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and goodbye. Thank you all, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yes.